So thanks, Jack, for coming in. Yeah. Shout out to me. I wanted Pleasure. to talk about uh, some of the responses to Hidden, in a, in a sense. I, I, I'm interested in the idea, and I think this has happened to you uh, a lot in a way, although the opposite has happened as well, is the uh, sense of expectation that, that writing about you can, can set up, either, either negatively or positively. Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea that, you know, people, I mean, I'm, I'm hesitating to say it to myself, but I'm almost going to say it to, to you, in fact, I am going to say it to you, that the album for me already is that is that almost horrible thing, you know, album of the year. It's like it's already yeah. got me that excited to want to, to, to label it. Right. This is going to be the best album you'll hear this year. And I wondered how that factors into your thinking as a, as a, as a musician. Is it something you actually kind of dread in a way because it sets up a almost the beginnings of a kind of hype? I don't know really. I doesn't really affect my thinking that much. I mean, I'm not. I don't ever usually think that much about that side of things. If you know what I mean. Some people, when there's a level of expectation set up, it can work, and for other people, there can be kind of a, 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 a kind of failure, if you like, you know, and it doesn't happen because yeah. people are expecting too much or they don't quite get what they think they were going to get. I quite like this music, and it's kind of what I wanted to do, so I'm not that bothered about what happens next too much. As long as I can survive, it's all right, yeah. really. Yeah. That is kind of really our level of ambition is survival beyond making music, sort of thing. So it's, it's okay, like, I would have been more worried last time had people thought it was really great or whatever. You don't feel yet that, that you've suffered from any kind of over expectation, you know, being positioned on those lists where people say this is, you know, that this year's ones to watch, etc, etc. Not really, I just take it as a compliment and leave it at that really. Yeah. I, think. I mean it's going to be hard to see, I suppose, live because it's so much of this is, obviously we don't even play any of the instruments that it's played on, so live mm. it's going to be different. Mm. I think that's the one thing that is kind of in the back of my mind, is that whether, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's impossible, and we're not going to try and make it the same life. Kind yeah, because I think what's interesting is, in a way, by the very nature of who you are and what you do, mm. you're, you're completely in the pop world to an extent. You know, yeah. you're reviewed in the pop world, you're reviewed yeah, in the yeah, pop yeah. group, with all all the advantages that has in terms yeah. of attention, but also the limitations in terms of the way people respond to what it is you're doing. All, all different words have their limita limitations, uh, and in a way, that's kind of what I was, I, I was thinking about when I was making it. It kind of mirrors it that. Like, to me, I can't really listen to classical music and I can't really listen to pop music. Classical music to me is always recorded craply. It's always like, yeah. I don't know, you know, this, and it's always presented in a really rubbish way. Yes. Like not, even, not even in a good crap way. Like you get dancehall, which is crap, but that's, that's a really excellent kind of crap. But then pop music, it's like, there's not enough happening really for me, in it? A lot yeah. of the time. And, but I like certain things like the, in pop music where there's like, I like the textures of it, and I like the momentary thing of it. But yeah, I was kind of thinking about combining the, the momentary kind of thing with it with classical music, kind of use something of, something of like wider, kind of musical themes and things like that. So, I don't know if that's related. Because that's always been the disappointment of a lot of, of, of certainly contemporary classical music yeah. when it started to become interesting in terms of its experiments with structure in the '60s. It was mm. recorded terribly. Yeah. So you'd get a Steve Rice piece that would be fascinating in in in, in theory, but it, it didn't use the recording studio in a way. It didn't use the, the the electronics in the way the rest of pop was. Yeah, yeah. It's always a shame. Like it's inescapable. Like you know, it's, yeah. It always seems like they've, it's kind of a last minute thing. Classical music, which is a shame. But yeah, like, but like at the same time, I always think that classical music, like. They always get rid of, like, especially contemporary classical music. As I was thinking about it, I was thinking about this on the train actually coming here. They always get, they always subtract everything that I think is interesting about it and like good about like composers and stuff. Is that like, like demonic composer? Like it's always like whenever you see pictures of new composers, they're always like looking really casual and like wearing a cap and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, I think that's like they're trying to make a concession to the pop world or something. Aren't they? So, it's what were your first thoughts for for what you wanted to achieve with this record? I mean, I, you know, the, the the very idea of taking of making something from nothing. And with all the possibilities that there are these days, both in the electronic world, which are sort of limitless and therefore mm. not much of a help, and then all the other areas that haven't been inherited that well. I mean, in a way, you know, to, to actually get that, that final sense of, of what sound and shape and story you wanted. I mean, how did all that kind of uh, gel? Well, I don't know. I, I was writing music that I thought was going to be for an album that I was thinking could be called Attack Music. Um, and that was like the, was like the harsh end of the spectrum of our album uh, kind of sounds like that now, like songs like the song Attack Music. 
like quite a beat driven mm -hmm. kind of thing. And then I was also writing just on my own, like woodwind pieces and stuff like that. And at some point, these two worlds were going along parallel, and I suddenly realised that they could kind of come together, like the two different pieces of music. Uh, I just had like a hunch, like a feeling about how that could sound quite good kind of thing. So that was sort of the beginning yeah. of it. But also a hunch, I guess, that it could sound quite bad in the way that hybrids can often fail. Yeah, that, but that's like the thing, because like, that's the thing, because like, if you think about hybrid music, it's, it's always terrible. Like, it's like when, I take, when, when you take things from certain kinds of music, I, th I always like to take something that's not the main thing, like, so you don't get a generalisation. It's like when people do like, like world music albums, or you know, albums that have a little bit of kind of, of kind of African feel or something like that. Yeah. That's always just so awful. So yeah, I mean, when when I say it like, yeah, I wanted to have classical type stuff and what classical type stuff and you know whatever Britney Spears type stuff. I mean, yeah, it kind of is misleading because that could be awful. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think it's always like I want to take the details, like what a certain dancehall drum sound is like, mm. and things like that, uh, and like a certain kind of rhythm, or something like that. But then do it in a completely different way, like translate it into different instruments or whatever. Yeah. What decision did you make about the combination of instruments you wanted? Because that also is something I'd never really thought about: is the, is the, is the, is the way that you put together an ensemble and what palette you use in terms of what you put together. Well, I started writing loads of music with like just for like ten bassoons, like, all the same instrument, and like music for like weird like ensembles like accordion and harpsichord and stuff like that. But like gradually just narrowed it down so that it just had. It was a bit purer kind of thing, so that we had like the melancholy kind of like, because I wanted to write stuff that sounded a bit like the sea sort of thing. So I wanted like a bit like the sea, uh -huh. as in like the real sea. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, yeah. So like woodwind and brass was quite handy for making that happen. Yes. And but also sub bass for like the dance y stuff and the dubby type, well not dub, but you know. And then also kind of done more other like dance all this stuff where it's like the kind of crappy sort of presets and also like kind of post neptune kind of sounds. I'm wondering how hard it is to ensure that that doesn't become one of those ugly kind of hybrids and, 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 and traditionally in, in a lot of English rock music or British rock music the, 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 there's been occasional attempts to, to, to put the two things mm. together and certainly one of those attempts led to the entire history of prog rock which mm. Your album sort of echoes and has yeah. ghostly re referrals to, you know, Van de Graaff Generator and things like that, you know, Soft Machine and Matching Mole. But you don't, you don't end up with that horrible sort of ELP mm, Genesis yeah. thing. I just knew how it could happen kind of thing. It wasn't like I was especially thinking, right, while I was writing it, I can make a hybrid between these two forms. That kind of came later when I realised I was doing it. Yeah. It's more like, what well, all this stuff about the hybrid is more like a, it's more like a, a way of talking about just kind of the, st the music I had in the back of my head, like, you know, it, it just sounded, I just, don't know, I just felt like I knew how I could make it sound quite good, yeah. I don't know. But yeah, I, I like, I do like some prog, like, uh, I play a lot of prog drums, mm -hmm. I can play along to like a lot of Van der Graaff Generator. Yeah. yeah it's, that's more just, I find it funny and enjoyable. And also that sense of the way you use sound almost like it's a radio play. Uh, and uh, you know, not not mm -hmm. in a in a, a, a sort of sound art way, a sonic art way, but just just as if it's almost like something from the nineteen forties uh, atmospheric play. <coughs> Whether it's the choir or the sword sound, mm -hmm. these kind of um, little details that go on. Yeah, I mean, I always think like when I when I watch like, films and stuff, there's always these incredible sounds like in sword fights and stuff like that in films, and I was wondering why those sounds aren't in music. And there are actually technical reasons why it doesn't work that well and everything, but we managed to get in there. And that was also part of my Britney Spears idea when I was thinking about that, kind of these really like, the beats made up of the sounds of kind of sword fights happening. But not kind of chopped up or anything, but like the actual sword fight happening, like I was sort of singing over the top of it. Yeah. And like we didn't have Britney Spears obviously, so I had to sing instead. Do you find yourself responding to the newer kind of music in whatever genre it's in? Because because it's it's often you surprise and the possibility of something yeah, new. I mean, I, I usually only like music that's either brand new or ancient kind of thing. Mm -hmm. like anything, with the exception of a few things, like I don't like anything basically between 1960 and 19, like probably 2005 or whatever. Everything between those years is. You don't like anything? Not really, no. <laughs> 
Well, I suppose there are exceptions, but... And, like, preferably nothing further back. Probably about 1600 is the cut-off point. Everything before that is good. Yeah. Everything after is rubbish, really. <laughs> Up until about 2005, I'd say. Is, is, that, is that based on listening a lot or just listening superficially? Uh... I mean, I listen to music quite a lot. Just kind of enjoy. It. I'm not. I'm not like. I don't know. I'm not. Don't know that much about. Yeah. Whatever. But yeah, like. I don't know. There's this point in music history where everything went wrong. From like I don't know, like Beethoven onwards, kind of thing to me. <laughs> Until about yeah, and then I like some certain sounds of pop music from like America. Yeah. The past ten years or so. And tell me a little bit more about the ancient, because I think there's, a, there's an ancient quality to, 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 to the group that's really fascinating. Uh, so on one hand, it's, it's you know, it's, a, a, you know a, a, all the fashion and all the, uh, the uh, a, 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 you know, enemy stuff and, and stuff that seems obvious, but, but, but it's, the, it's the mystical ancient side that that's actually seems more interesting. I just enjoy like, music like William Byrd and stuff like that. That's what I listen to kind of thing like. But yeah, it's like, uh, there's one song that I deliberately wanted to make sound ancient on our album, which is Orion. Uh, but that's, I don't know if that's a different thing to what you're on about, but just with like the children, I wanted to make it sound like a children singing from like a ancient civilization kind of thing. Yeah. And, and, and what would be the ideal for how you perform? Us live. Because uh, how are you going to do it? Well, because we can't afford to like have you know, thirteen-piece woodwind and brass and stuff, and a children's choir or whatever. So it's going to be a lot of smoke and mirrors, like sound for the laptop stuff like that. Yeah. Like that. But in an ideal world, I mean, I suppose yeah, we'd play with all that stuff. Yeah. We're going to actually in London on our London shows. Who, who are you going to play with? I mean, we're going to get like we just got some of the musicians that played on the right. album kind of thing coming along. To and what does it sound like without it? Or do you, do you have it as backing tape? Do you still have no, it? No, no, you see, we try and get a good balance. Like, we want to make as much of it played by us as possible. Mm. The thing is, like, if we, what we tried to do before is make it all played by us, like, trigger or whatever by mm. us. But then we're all, like, it's really difficult because it's like, it looks like we're not doing anything, we're actually doing loads of stuff. Yeah. Whereas, actually, it's kind of better to have some stuff running off a laptop that someone can adjust sometimes, but then, like, whatever, three people playing the drums at the same time. Yeah. Like, yeah. It just looks more... Gesture or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But it's hard, yeah. But t tell me about the mix stage of the, of the record, because that must have been a key area where you, you had the, you know, the the, the the areas that you wanted, and mm. then you, to put them together. What, what what kind of decisions did you make at that stage? Well, kind of the funny thing is, because when we recorded it, it was all so composed that basically recording was just filling in the blanks, kind of thing. Like we had the songs mm. structures sketched out or whatever and in software or whatever, and then it was really just filling in the, the instruments. It was like a kind of military operation kind of thing, like we do all the bassoon and one day all the country scene. So when we got to mix it, like everything was there, like exactly how it should be, but in fact it was mixed by Dave Cooley, who's um, like uh, from LA, and mm. it was mixed Jay Diller and MF Doom and various other good hip hop people, like Stone Through hip hop people. And that was like something to try and, because we had all these like beautiful recordings that was mostly like that, ec that audio, the quality of it is mostly down to Graham Sutton, but, uh, so then to kind of, uh, I don't know whether to ruin that or just kind of mm. get rid of the authenticity or, or give it that, that pumping kind of like dance all thing or modern pop thing. We got Dave Cooley so he could, you know, make like these really colossal kind of sub bass and stuff like that. So that was the main decision. Like I had made, had kind of suggested that ages before and it's like probably quite a big risk because he, in hip hop or whatever, mm. there's singing and a beat or whatever, vocals and a beat. But now there's like, on We and War, it's like there's like 500 tracks or whatever of different things. So, yeah. in a lot of ways, it sounded really terrible. Like, it didn't sound very good to be with. But then, like, as like, he got more and more used to, adjusted to it, kind yeah. of started to work. Yeah, there's loads of risks like that. I mean, it could have gone horribly wrong. Because yeah. I, I think that's what I, I I love about it so much is that I've always had this this emptiness that classical music yeah. sounds so awful. Even even the great stuff that's on ECM, somehow it still feels like a paste. It doesn't have that. Yeah sonic kind of a distinction and then on this you get that sudden sense of for me of of the newness of this is how it could be yeah 
uh, and it can have all the presets and it can have all those yeah. you know sounds we're familiar with but by the very nature of having that other stuff it suddenly becomes incredibly surreal and 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 fabulous yeah i'm, I'm pretty pleased with the actual <laughs> sound of no the wood and the brass though, yeah, like yeah yeah i mean just yeah like, i mean the way classical music is recorded is depressing at times well anyway thank you joe oh yeah it was yeah, really wonderful thank you.